Lawrence, what do you think is the role of the finance community, of investors more broadly, into this transition, if you want to call it that way, towards a more sustainable or a more responsible economy? What's their role? The investment community controls the wealth of the world. That is a reality. 80 trillion. It's the wealth of the world. And that which it does not control directly in terms of whether shares or capital, in terms of uh, lending bonds, it actually controls indirectly. It owns the shares of the companies that generate the loans that goes to companies. So the investment community controls the capital of the world. In other words, we have it in our hands to shape the kind of world we want to live in. And what do we want? We want a world that is better, that we can live in better. Now, when we talk about responsible investing, what are we talking about? We're talking about investing in such a way that is sustainable over the long term. Because my point is that irresponsible investing is bad financial investing because it's good in the short term, but in the long term it creates problems, both financial problems, non-sustainable businesses, and societal problems which takes away your license to operate. And therefore, in a long-winded way of saying, the investment community is crucial. It holds in its hands the tools with which we can shape the future mm -hmm. of our society. Mm -hmm. And we have a choice. We can do it in the right way, which is beneficial for all of us in the long term. That's responsible investing, mm -hmm. more uh, socially equal, if you like, uh, with better purpose. Or we can decide simply to behave as if we're in a casino, mm -hmm. which I would argue is a stupid thing to do. Yeah. So within that co entire community, though, I think we see a, ve a, a wide diversity of approaches towards this idea of responsibility. And as you said, you know, you can imagine those that are greenwashing and putting a label just for the marketing aspect of it, all the way to investors that truly integrate ESG in, 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 in what they do, or they call it ESG at least. So what is unique uh, about what Hermes does in this, in this period? So Hermes is unique because of its history, so it's nothing to do with me, and its composition. In terms of its history, I think, uh, there are two things that it decided very early on. One is because it was the money of the pensioners who worked in the BT pension mm -hmm. scheme and because there was an equal representation of the workers on the board, mm -hmm. it wanted not only to make money with its investments but to do good. Mm -hmm. That integrated the idea that doing good, mm -hmm. ESG, actually is part of what we do. By 2007, one of my predecessors came up with the idea, let's measure if that detracted value or added value. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, actually, it added value financially. The second thing that happened is because we were one of the first to have um, a, a, an index fund ever uh, in-house in 1985, we discovered that actually owning shares is about stewardship. It's about owning responsibility for the shares, mm -hmm. and therefore we integrated it. So we integrated it in what we do. Now, other people, as you rightly say, have now taken this up, which is good. Even if it's greenwashing, it's good because eventually it'll become the real thing. But there's still something unique about Hermes, and this is what's unique. When you come to join Hermes, you sign a pledge. It's not a Hermes pledge, it's a personal pledge. It's a, some of the things that you'd expect, but actually people in finance do not sign. I will act ethically. I'll put the interest of my client before the interest of my business. I will work for the environment. I will help society around me. And we pay half of our bonuses for people being nice, meaning actually adhering to the pledge. And over time, what that has done is we've created essentially a community, which remember, asset management and investment is a harsh community where people tend to rub against each other the wrong way, but a very collegiate one mm -hmm. where people are cooperative, where they do produce, and where the performance is outstanding, and where they feel they have value and purpose. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that's exactly what the clients want. And so we've grown our business exponentially. It turns out being good is just good business. I think you bring up a fascinating topic because I think this idea of, of incentivizing people is quite intriguing. So you, you, you do this as a, as a company and we can see a range of companies that now introduce non-financial objectives into their bonuses, into their remuneration and so on, which takes us, of course, to the broader issue, I think, of, of, of governance, right? And the, the, perhaps the role of investors into the governance of companies. So I wanted to ask you another question, which is about, you know, there's a lot of discussion discussion of whether uh, uh, investors should engage with companies and therefore uh, you know, enable them to they themselves become stewards of the environment, for instance, or they should just you know, step back, divest, especially when we talk about sin industries or contested industries. So do you have any views about these, this uh, idea of divestment versus engagement? What is the purpose of what we're trying to do? I would like, for example, for coal companies eventually to shut down operations and hand, stop, stop investing and hand back the money to investors. Now, 
How can I achieve that? If I simply divest, because so much of the world now is essentially in index funds, I'm not doing anything. If I campaign to make people not want to use coal, I can influence the regulator. That's possible. If I campaign with the companies and convince them to give me back the money rather than invest it, that's helping the final objective. So I don't believe in divestment mm -hmm. precisely because I believe I want the end objective. I want to stop the warming of the planet. I don't want some companies to produce sinful stuff. Yeah. And the only way I can do it is if I engage with them. Right. Right. I wonder though in your experience, in your multi-year experience in this in this in the investment community, what is the the type of changing mindsets that you have seen or shifting mindsets perhaps? Because some would say, oh, we need to make ESG mainstream, and others would say, well, actually it's the mainstream that needs to go ESG. How could you possibly invest without accounting for these factors? So we, it's, it, so the approach should be the other way around. So what is, in your experience, what's the sort of the shift in the mindset and, and, and the attitudes that so you have seen? It, it's been fascinating. And let's separate slightly the um, Europe from the US. And I'll come back to the US because it is an important one. Um, six years ago, uh, when we talk about Hermes, because we integrate ESG in what we do in Hermes, uh, the, the Financial Times ran an article about me which very kindly called me a hippie. Now, I'd like to have been a hippie, but I'm six years too young, so I missed it. Now, the point that we're trying to make is we were out there. Right? Today, uh, when I go to the Investment Association with all the great and the good of the CIOs and CEOs of the asset management company, all of them in London, they all of them believe in ESG. All of them, right? Yeah. Now, why? Because there's a demand. Do I really believe they integrate it? No. Do they say that they, they integrate it? Yes, they do. What are they doing? They're just ticking boxes. But it's okay. It's like greenwashing, right? Once you start the journey, you'll continue on it. And the reason is that society is demanding it. So there is a societal shift, and you can see this in the change in regulations in Europe. In China, for example, it happened because President Xi in 2017, in a conference in Shanghai in the summer, said that finance should do more than just make money. It should provide service to society. That's a shift. The United States remains the outlier because of their particular uh, uh, definition of fiduciary duty, which is just to make money, uh, the F Milton Friedman concept. Uh, and we are arguing in the United States that, yes, but the only way to do that is to integrate ESG. So ultimately, you end up at the same space. And asset managers want to go there because the clients want to go there. It's interesting because a lot of the people usually they pose a trade-off between ESG and financial performance and that you know companies that integrate ESG they're not actually profit maximizers but actually if what I hear you say is well we all agree on the objective the, the question is the way to get there right so it's the question of whether an exclusive sort of shareholder focus will get you there versus a broader perhaps stakeholder focus and and I'm glad you, you mentioned this idea of the fiduciary duty because I also wanted to ask you that uh, what are some of the institutions, whether we talk about regulations or governments and so on, what are some of the institutions or the factors that you think enable uh, investors to do that, to integrate, really integrate ESG, but also what are some of the factors that we need to address that perhaps put obstacles in the way that perhaps other investors want to do, but they just can't or they think they can't? So one of, uh, one of the obstacles in Europe until recently and the passing of the new EU law was that investors believed if they were trustees, that they couldn't take ESG into account unless they were specifically asked to do so, typically by somebody very wealthy. That has been removed. So that then opens a debate between people like us and others perhaps, but they're dwindling. And people like us say, well, actually, to get maximum returns, you've got to integrate ESG. To us, the, the discussion is about time horizon. It's about time horizon. If you are truly an investor over a 10-year time horizon, five to 10 years, there is no other way but to integrate it. If your time horizon is 20 years, which is the typical time for investing for a pension scheme, you have to take the environment into concern because that's essentially a fat tail risk. Uh, and societal disruption, that's fat tail risk as well and social license. So we, I can't see how you cannot integrate it. The other obstacle is teaching a new generation of business people that actually business skills are not just the skills of the balance sheet. That's important. I love my PL and I understand it intimately, but actually that's secondary. It's understanding the people you work with. It's understanding the people you serve. Because at the end of the day, businesses, all businesses, serve their customers. Just like all CEOs serve the people who work in the company. All companies serve the customers. And by serving the customers, they create the wealth that serves the shareholders. That's the link. It's about service and about being responsible to each other. So the skills that the new generation has to learn, I think, 
is the importance of people. Because ultimately, this is all about Homo sapiens sapiens, right? And our interaction. And that then allows you to invest responsibly. And by investing responsibly, in fact, you're investing for the long term. And it turns out that's how you maximize your return. Mm -hmm. So I'm not disagreeing with Milton Friedman. Yeah. I'm just disagreeing with his methodology and say, calling into question and saying the right way of doing it is actually to integrate society and right. stakeholders. Right. You, you mentioned the, the skill set that's needed going forward. So I was, was wondering if you were to you know, speak to uh, uh, people that are in business schools today, that are students today, they're doing their MBA or their master's in finance or any other degree today, and they, they want through their own careers to have a positive impact, whether it's through finance or also more broadly. What are some of your key pieces of advice? So the first thing I'd say that they've chosen the right career to impact because finance does shape the world. That is the reality. The second thing I think I'd say is bring yourself to work. Whatever business you do, whether you join a business or create your own business, bring yourself to work. Don't leave your morality, your values at home. Your workplace should reflect your values and don't join a firm in which you cannot fully live your values. I'm not saying about just right and wrong. I'm saying as a person, as a mother, as a father, as a sister, as a husband, as a wife, as a partner, all of these are your values. Why you're more productive that way. And the third one is understand businesses do not exist in vacuums. Businesses exist in society. Your client base is society. Your colleagues are society. Your stakeholders wider are society. Learn to understand society. The best businesses are those that integrate into society and survive for a long time. The shortest living businesses are those that live in a vacuum. That's the reality. Wonderful. So thank you very much for great insights and for this interview. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.